This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I now call upon Professor Barry C. Smith, Pro Dean of the School of Advanced Study and Director of the Institute of Philosophy, to give the oration for Heston Blumenthal, our honorary graduate. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it was a long but determined road that led Heston Blumenthal to become what uh, he has been acknowledged by his peers to be among perhaps the leading world chef in terms of creativity and in terms of his incredible innovation and use of new techniques. The rise to the top of his profession was fast, but what was extraordinary was the path he took to get there. It wasn't spending years as a commie chef peeling potatoes. It wasn't spending years as a sous chef topping and tailing beans. It wasn't working for a tyrannical master that dictated orders. No, none of this. That was not his way. Instead, the route that led to the meteoric rise of Heston Blumenthal as one of the legendary greats of cooking was scholarship. Quite simply, he read books. Lots of them. As a youngster, he devoured master chefs of Europe, great chefs of France, the Gourmet's Tour de France. He read books in French, and he doesn't speak French. <laughs> he read Les Recettes Originales, Les Guides Michelin, translating them painstakingly with the help of a French-English dictionary. This was incredible dedication. But what inspired this devotion? Well, the answer was a life-changing moment in 1982, when as a 16-year-old schoolboy, he and his sister were taken by their parents to the three Michelin star restaurant Lusteau de Beaumanière in Provence. The ceremony, the special atmosphere, <clears throat> the formality and the culinary experiences that he uh, encountered there were to introduce him to a special world that were to change his life forever. The memory of that experience was imprinted on his mind, and I hope we will hear maybe a little bit about it later. <coughs> and the momentary nature of these life-changing experiences are important. They're epiphanies. They're moments that change you for good and for life. They etch themselves on the mind and on the memory with incredible precision. They come back to you again and again in recollection, unbidden. And like the first time that you taste a truly outstanding wine or a really great dish, everything goes quiet. Your attention is utterly captured. You remember everything about the moment, who was there, the color of the wallpaper, the sounds around you. And the experience is so important, you might say it's as if the brain says, hold on, something special is happening, pay attention. The senses quicken, you bind all of the information from smell, from sight, from touch, into a single recollected episode. And that moment, and ones like it, is when you're suddenly aware of something you didn't know before. Something, although immediate and personal, is much larger than you. Until that moment, you didn't know that food or wine could do that. In such moments, you become suddenly but lastingly aware of the power and effects that tastes and flavors have, that smells and aromas have. Each of us, from the very moment of birth, start to exercise our power of discrimination for what we smell, for what we taste. <clears throat> taste and smell are the gatekeepers to what enters the body from the environment, what you will accept and what you won't. And it's in these moments, if you're to be aware and to capture them, that you come to discover, to learn and to appreciate not just something about the food, but something about yourself. And it was just such a moment that led the young Heston Blumenthal to dedicate himself from then on to cuisine and to cooking of the very highest order. Now one might be keen to 
recreate that very moment, but like the first kiss that will never be there again, it's not that same experience you want, it's more like them. It's realizing that perhaps those experiences are available and can be sought out. But I think in the case of Heston Blumenthal, the point to notice here was not that he just sought to give himself more of these experiences. From that moment on, he decided and was determined to try to provide those experiences for others. And I think that, that urge to communicate, that urge to convey something of that passion and the excitement that he felt, there is something of the teacher in him. He strives to let you understand something that he has understood, something that he is able to do and bring to you. And a restless search begins at that point for these intense experiences, for these moments that are quite out of the ordinary, they're extraordinary. And this led Heston Blumenthal to devote himself to an interest in creating flavors and in experiencing tastes and providing them for other <coughs> tasters and diners. Now, de deciding to dedicate himself to the art of cooking and practicing his art, he soon realized that he both needed art and science. For Blumenthal, the need was to understand what he was doing. He didn't want just to carry out the processes that led to the creation of these delicious <coughs> tasting moments or experiences. He wanted to understand them. He wanted to know what the underlying mechanisms were that turned the alchemy of ordinary ingredients into extraordinary experiences. He wanted to know the mechanisms that converted starch and sugars into new forms, and this drove him on. And for someone with his style of mind, it's not enough to do what the recipe books tell him, even though he had read by this time more than I think most of us will ever read. He didn't want to follow the recipes slavishly, he wanted to understand what tricks, what magic was being performed, and what signs underlay the transformation of the ordinary into the extraordinary. And he was inspired, I know, by the words of a professor of physics at Oxford, Nicholas Curti, who said, it's a terrible thing that we know more about what's going on in the atmosphere of Venus than we know about what is happening in a souffle in our own kitchen. And in his TV program in the 1960s, Nicholas Curtis showed us what was happening in a souffle by putting a thermocouple probe in it and observing temperature changes. <coughs> Curtis was perhaps the leading inspiring force behind the new modernist cuisine with its scientific turn. And Essen Blumenthal learned early that the more he knew, the more doubtful he could be of the advice he was given by the authorities pronouncing so readily in the books that he had consulted. On reading a book on food and cooking by Henry McGee, on the science of cooking, he learned that much of what passed as lore in the kitchen was in fact false. And from that moment on, he had a philosophical urge, a very philosophical urge, which for someone in my own discipline of philosophy, I can only admire. From that moment on, his desire was to question everything. <coughs> Thus began Heston's curiosity and passion for the chemistry and the physics of foods, for the structure of meat and vegetables, for the bonding together of starch and sugar molecules with emulsifiers during the cooling of chocolate. And he worked with um, a disciple of, of Curti, Peter Barnum, at the University of Bristol, who helped him, because he needed help, with how to boil so many green beans in the tiny kitchen that he was operating in, in Bray, in what we now know as the Fat Duck. Thus, his career began as a chef who applied science to make and create better and better dishes. And the processes that he invented are now commonplace triple cooked chips, spherical this and that, savory ice creams, they're de rigueur. Today's theater is tomorrow's church. And this work was aided by science, but the results may have had a greater impact than many of those in science. And I know that Hessen Blumenthal likes the quote 
from the philosopher of taste, Bria Savaran, when he says, the discovery of a new dish does more for human happiness than the discovery of a new star. Surely true. And brilliant dishes were discovered, and accolades soon came for the invention, and especially for the precision, and the sheer daring of the cooking that was taking place in the kitchen in the fat duck in Bray. Originally equipped as a very simple uh, bistro kitchen from what had been uh, previously a pub, Hessen Lewenha had to work his magic with very inadequate tools, gas pressure of the ordinary sort that supplies houses rather than of the pumped up industrial sort that feeds proper cooking stoves. And in the early days, his stove actually blew up, and we had the sight, if you could take yourself back and see it, of a man who had burned off hair and eyebrows, still providing service, with a bag of frozen peas strapped to his head to get him through the, the, the final hours of his craft. Now, it wasn't all plain sailing. If you're committed, as Heston Blumenthal is, to experimental study and testing, then the experimental approach requires you to have another virtue of the scientist. You must have the courage to fail. And he did fail with many of his dishes. And many of his young chefs and colleagues would have liked me to tell you some of the stories of them, but I've been forbidden to do so, and certainly not allowed to use their names. Fail and fail better, Samuel Beckett once said, because in that way you learn, and in that way you improve. And I think something of that is in the spirit and the style and the mind of Heston Blumenthal. And from that learning comes real advance. And the real advance led to real rewards. In 1998, he gained his first Michelin star at the Fat Duck. In 2001, the second. And by 2004, he had joined the pantheon of rare talents that achieved three Michelin stars. Strange to think of this as a much coveted prize given out by a tire manufacturer whose logo is a rather fat man made out of tires. Nonetheless, no mean achievement. Now another triumph was in 2005 where leading chefs judged him to have the best restaurant in the world. And his staff, I'm happy to say, remain excited, loyal, and full of affection for Heston. These are not chefs, these are not serving staff suffering under a torrent of insults. Instead, they are people who learn, who are challenged, who are inspired by his passion, his precision, and above all else, by his generosity. And this respect and admiration, I think also leaks out beyond the kitchen beyond the serveries into the nation at large. It's not for nothing that we know him by his single name, Heston. He's a figure, I think, who we hold in great affection, and that single-named appellation is not given to all celebrity chefs. The honors and awards soon followed. He was the first chef to be awarded an honorary fellowship of the Royal Society of Chemistry in 2006, Honorary degrees followed from the University of Reading in 2006 in recognition of his unique scientific approach to food and long-standing relationship with the university's School of Food Biosciences. In 2007, he was given an honorary Master of Science from the University of Bristol, and then in 2008, he was an awarded an OBE by Her Majesty the Queen for his services to British astronomy. In all of this work, we see a respect for tradition and a desire for innovation. And as in cooking, so in the style with which he pioneers his modernist cuisine, it's always the intention to walk a line between tradition and innovation. And it's the great balance of that culinary skill that has led him to receive these accolades. He knows he's building on existing knowledge, but he's also advancing it. And it's building up cumulatively and as we know in science, the achievements and the advances are done collectively. And for that reason, Essen Blumenthal is a passionate advocate of collaboration, of sharing knowledge, and of inviting people in 
to help create and co-create some of the wonderful things that he does in cooking. But above all else, I think he is also a communicator. In each of the dishes, in each of the experiences he creates, there is an invitation to understand. To understand something about the food and to understand something about yourself. And in that way, he hopes to convey to you, he hopes to get across to you, some of the original excitement he felt when creating the dishes and when first experiencing them as a young boy in Provence. Now there is the science of food and the science of cooking, but as well as food, there are also those who eat it, the tasters, the diners. And recently, there has been great advance conducted by Hessen Blumenthal and his collaborators, and I'm glad to say with some of the people who are now associated with our Center for the Study of the Senses here in the Institute of Philosophy in the School of Advanced Study, there is a concentration on the psychology of the diner, an understanding and an awareness of just how many senses we're using when we eat and when we experience the way we select food, the way we choose it, the way we consume it, the way we appreciate it. If anything, we know now, we know that the senses do not operate in isolation. We don't just see and hear and smell and taste as if they were going on in separate domains. These senses cooperate and collaborate to give you the view of the world and your understanding and contact with it that you ordinarily enjoy. And in the Center for the Study of the Senses, we have been looking at some of these interactions and so we have become fascinated by flavor perception and by the work of pioneers like Hesse Blumenthal who know that how you taste food, how you enjoy it, how you experience it will depend on many things that are going on around you, many of the shaping influences on what you eat and drink. And for that reason, we have been able to work with um, chefs and front of house staff at the Fat Duck who have come to the Center for the Study of the Senses and with us conducted experiments and training on the effect of music and lighting and background aromas and expectations on how you taste and how you experience food. And the connections are surprising and interesting. Did you know, when you think of how your senses collaborate, did you know that there are aromas in shampoo that make your hair feel softer? Strange. In that way, smell can affect what you touch, touch can affect what you see, what you see can affect what you hear, and so the senses constantly are in this crosstalk, this interaction. Now, the way in which our knowledge of these interactions has been built up has been by looking at particular types of experience that are every day, that are routine, the experience of eating and drinking. And through his collaborations, Heston Blumenthal has not just used this science, he's contributed to it. He's contributed to it with colleagues like Professor Charles Spence from the University of Oxford, who is one of our co-collaborators and co-investigators in a large grant project at the Center for the Study of the Senses. And the work that he did with Charles Spence was to look at the influence of sound on what we taste. Now, who would have thought that sound had an influence on what you put in your mouth and how you experience it. But there are many influences. In a lovely piece of work that Heston Blumenthal and Charles Spence conducted, they had oysters split into halves on pins fed to undergraduates in Oxford. And not knowing which half they were eating, but asked to rate them, they were sometimes eating the oysters listening to barnyard sounds and sometimes listening to the sound of the sea. And when they were listening to the sound of the sea, the oysters tasted saltier. Wonderful result. Now that result and that identification between having the right soundscape for what's going on in your mouth led to the development of a now famous dish that Charles helped to uh, design along with Heston, but was pioneered by Heston primarily, and that is the famous dish, The Sound of the Sea. I won't tell you more about it, but I urge you to Try to go to Bray and experience it for yourselves. Now, Heston Blumenthal also knew and saw that there was a connection between the descriptions that we gave to food and the way we evaluated them. He had had on one of his earliest menus an accompanying 
uh, part of the, the dish was crab ice cream. Crab ice cream, people say. Ooh, I don't like that. And he noticed if you called it crab savory mousse, people were very happy to eat it. And as a result of that observation, he went on to work with and publish a well-respected and much quoted scientific paper uh, by himself and Martin Humans, a professor of psychology from Sussex, where they created a dish by Eslin of smoked salmon ice cream. Now you give two groups the smoked salmon ice cream to eat. One group is told, here is a novel ice cream, rate it for sweetness, saltiness, how much you enjoy it, creaminess and so on. The other group is told, it's a frozen savory mousse. No prizes for guessing who likes it, but the interesting finding is that when it's described as an ice cream, it's rated as saltier. Now is that because expectation and mere linguistic description can change the threshold for the perception of salt? That's an incredible influence on the things that are going on as you eat and as you drink. And I think we're unaware of just how many influences there are on our ordinary everyday experience of choosing and selecting, looking and reading labels. As a result of this work and much else, Heston went on to provide some of the some of the public's favorite ridiculous dishes, as they would say. Why on earth do we need bacon and egg ice cream? What's the point of that? Well, bacon and egg ice cream, it's a challenge. But the thing about the bacon and egg ice cream that is scientifically interesting and fascinating and of vital importance to people who work on the way our senses function is the fact that when you eat the bacon and egg ice cream, it's served with a piece of fried bread, and you're invited to eat them all together. When you put the fried bread and the ice cream in your mouth, the bacon flavor migrates to the fried bread. It's as if that's where you're tasting it. It's a kind of ventriloquism, because the eggy flavor should stay with the ice cream and the creamy yolk, the bacon flavor should be something whose texture is appropriate. That's a fascinating result, and again, it contributes to the advancement of science. Now, I've said how much Heston likes to collaborate. I've said how generous he is in acknowledging and respecting those he works with and of citing them. And I just want to finish by reading out a statement which he makes as part of a chef's statement that declares the principles and values that he stands for. He says, the act of eating engages all the senses as well as the mind. Preparing and serving food could therefore be the most complex and comprehensive of the performing arts. To explore the full expressive potential of food and cooking, we collaborate with scientists from food chemists to psychologists, with artisans and artists from all walks of the performing arts. Architects, designers, industrial engineers. We also believe in the importance of collaboration and generosity among cooks, a readiness to share ideas and information together with the full acknowledgement of those who invent new techniques and dishes. Here then is a commitment to scholarship, to acknowledgement, to attribution of invention, to precision, to restless inquiry, to the need to test and confirm for oneself, to challenge and advance knowledge and to share it with others. We share these values and today we are here to celebrate them. And for that reason, Vice Chancellor, we recommend Heston Mark Blumenthal for the award of the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. Um, I remember a G7 summit 
when Glen Eagle was in Scotland, when, uh, when Jacques Chirac said, uh, Britain has the worst food in Europe, second only to Finland. <laughs> so at the risk of insulting any Finnish people out there, it was a bit of a big insult. Um, and in fact, in fact, I don't know if anyone remembers, but it was within a couple of weeks of London and Paris fighting out for the, uh, for the Olympics. And as a result of uh, Jack Sherratt's comments, the uh, two Finnish representatives withdrew their votes from Paris. <laughs> so we got the Olympics because of our food. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where I sit anyway. Um, but I have to say, probably, I was born in the 60s and uh, grew up in the 70s. So I say in that, in that decade, he was probably right. It was pretty awful. I mean, there was one type of spaghetti you could buy in the supermarket. One that's on pasta, it was a, the spaghetti in the blue wrapper. And olive oil, you couldn't buy that in the supermarket, you had to go to the chemist. Because you poured it in your ears when they were, they were blocked. And no one ever cooked with it. And um, so I, my mum was, and, and, and is a, a great cook, but I didn't grow up with, I don't think I even knew what an oyster looked like. Um, and we went to Cornwall every year for a holiday, and one year, and Barry said I was 19, yeah, early 80s, we went to France, and I was very lucky enough to have the same first time experience with my sister and my parents in this three mission style restaurant. And I remember it so vividly, um, because I didn't have any knowledge of gastronomy whatsoever, we sat um, in this, on this shady terrace, just outside this Provencal old farmhouse, nestled at the foot of a bauxite cliff. Someone down the cliff was up and you could just hear the, the noise of the cricket starting to get loud and the smell of lavender filled the air. The noise, I remember things like the noise of the feet of the waiting staff crunching on the gravel. And the cheese trolley was the size of a chariot and they were pouring sauces into souffles and carving legs of land on the table and the chink of the glasses and the sommelier with his hand around moustache and his leather apron and his tassel band. And it was just for me, it was as if I'd fallen down some kind of rabbit hole into a wonderland. And that was it, I was hooked. And that was the moment I was lucky enough to find something that, well, whether I liked it or not, it was to take over my life for many years to come. And, um, and then, I think, moved forward to it was the mid-80s, where I, when I thought, I was, from there I was, I was sort of teaching myself the basics of classical French cooking. From sauce making to souffle making, I spent time with butchers, and saved up, saved up, saved up. Almost a year, and then blew almost a year's worth of savings on a two-week trip to France. And then one year, I had, had an old proton, and uh, I sold it because I couldn't perform a trip to France. So I sold the proton. So I basically ate a proton, <laughs> paid my paid my trip to France. And all along, I was I was I was eating, I was reading, I was cooking. And mid '80s, I read I read. Uh, what Harold Bailey's book, and it was about the science of cooking, not food science. Food science is something you go, you know, you're doing the biosciences, and maybe you go to work for an ice cream and you're looking at how you can increase the um, 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 overall, so the ice cream's capacity to take a bed. So you look at the structure of ice creams. But this wasn't about that. This was why do you eggs make your souffles right? And then when I left school with an A level in art, I failed my chemistry overall. I'm rather embarrassed to say. Uh, and, um, but from there, there was a point in, uh, in Harold's book and he said, browning meat doesn't keep in the juices. Now this flew in the face of one of the most biblical kitchen laws uh, in French cooking is that brown, you have to brown the meat to see in the juices. And he went to explain why. And if you think about a steak, it's 70 odd percent water. It's a lump of protein, like a wet sponge. The more you cook it, the higher the temperature you cook it, think about scrambling eggs. The proteins coagulate as they coagulate, the sponge shrinks and the water comes out. You don't need to think about if you put a steak in a very hot pan of oil, what does it do? It sizzles. The fat doesn't sizzle. So it's the water, it's the moisture coming out. And after you said that, I thought, oh my god, that's so obvious. It took reading it um, like that. To be to, for, for it to be obvious. And from that moment, I don't, I don't think I was inquisitive as a kid. From that moment, I just questioned everything. Absolutely everything. Um, and that kind of led to uh, the of my first um, dish, which was triple cooked chips. So one of my mates went out having 10 pints of beer, a couple of kebabs, a good old punch up. 
I always kind of think, why are the chips so soggy? <laughs> and, uh, and it was really looking at what happened in the centre of the chip. So obviously the moisture in the centre of the chip, the chip then starts to boil when it falls because the steam, the steam wants to escape, the chip goes, uh, goes soggy. And so I looked always that I could remove excess moisture from the centre of the chip without doing too much to make it go like a of wood, um, right down to pin pricking. Um, somebody, somebody wrote, life is too short to, to uh, stuff a mushroom. Oh no, it's not. <laughs> um, anyway, then from there, I suppose my, my first area of the real science I started looking into was ice cream. I got really frustrated you would take 20 chefs' cookbooks and take 20, 20 vanilla ice cream recipes. They're not vanilla. Someone have whole eggs, someone have egg yolks, someone have sugar, some glucose, some honey. Someone have double cream, single cream, wicked cream, mascarpone, whole milk. And the list went on. And I thought, well, why are these ingredients in this ice cream? Is it because they've just been handed down? That's the recipe they were taught, or is there a reason for them? Um, and then you look at if you take a, if you take a, uh, a glass of water, you freeze it, go to a block of ice. You start putting things like sugar in, you suppress the, the freezing the uh, freezing temperature, and then the, that texture changes. So those role, those ingredients all play a role. Then I came across. And I came across a recipe for a Sicilian recipe for parmesan ice cream in about, about 1800s. And I remember thinking, that's really bizarre. Why should parmesan ice cream be bizarre? Only because we grow up with ice cream being sweet. And it's about the context. Um, and indeed, as Barry said, in 1997, my first open duck in 95, the other blew up on me. I had all sorts of disasters. I, I re actually, I reached depths of exhaustion I never knew possible. I remember the real kind of Alice in Wonderland moment. I love the way that Lewis Carroll um, kind of puts Alice in these totally surreal situations that she tries to pull some logic out of. So when she goes into the stream, she, she, uh, she's swimming and she swims past a mouse. And she says, I know how to say good day to a mouse. How do I say good day to a, to a swimming mouse? And that kind of, there was a moment where uh, we had a simple lemon tart, sprinkled with sugar, caramelised with a blowtorch. I was so exhausted, I remember turning the gas on, walking over to the sink, turning on the hot tap, because I thought, you can't possibly light a blowtorch with cold water. <laughs> and, and, um, and so from then, 1997 is when I put the, the crab ice cream dish. And it really was. For me, I was exploring just different textures and, um, and temperatures of one main ingredient. Inspired by this, I said that, that Parmesan ice cream and the ability to be able to reduce sugar content in ice cream, but still keeping the ice cream small enough to keep the ice cream smooth. And I was fascinated. Some people would love it, but some people just couldn't get their hand and their heads around it. That, in fact, shows how far we've come from then. If I say crab ice cream now, most people don't actually bat an eyelid. Ten years ago, I'd be like I'd be the devil, shocking things at me, and you know, this. Um, but I just found it fascinating if you said, taste this, it's crab ice cream, you'd have the one reaction. Taste this, it's a frozen crab, it's, so the barrier comes down, it's fine. And again, it's context. Then you start realising, in fact, um, this whole thing about taste and flavour perception, I think there's more chromosomes in the body that, that, that are responsible for that than anything else that you it does. And the scent is effectively tools, they're just the same as if you look at take herbs, meat, ingredients, and those senses then feed information into the brain. And the memory is the thing that really enables us to try and put everything together. And um, that's where the for me the fascination comes into. And that's where the food can be so just can, can be so emotional. You think about an example about context, you go to the Loire Valley, weekend. Last weekend break, and you're sitting imagine this, by the river, sun shining on, glistening on the water, little diamonds, and there's a soft, warm breeze, and the grass is just just flowing in the breeze. And you're sitting there, um, table and chairs, glistening with fresh oysters, an ice bucket. You hear the bottle of mosca there going, coming out of the bucket, the cheek of the ice, pour it into the glass, the sun sh shining off the glass, and you take it up and you have a sip. And you go, oh my God, I've never tasted mosca there like this in my life before. Ever. So what do you do? You buy 37 cases. <laughs> you strap it to your car, you take it home. And then you invite your most airlight friends, your gastronomic uh, acquaintances, your boss, and you 
off your chest down, you served in, you pop the cork, and you think, oh my god, that's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and then people say, well, what, it doesn't travel. Do you mind that? If wine didn't travel, then we, will, we wouldn't really be drinking hardly any wine in this country at all. What you haven't done is you haven't brought your weekend break and, and the Loire Valley with the grass swaying in the rain, wind and the uh, glistening water. And, and this is where just food has this ability to be able to generate that emotion. And the amazing thing is with perception is the brain doesn't need all the bits of the jigsaw to, to, to complete the picture. So with the sound of the sea, we started um, um, when I uh, first met Charles. I was like 2000, 2000, yeah, then. And Charles did this experiment, stuck in a booth and uh, stuck headphones on me and gave me some Pringles. And I asked him to crunch into the microphone. I was kind of listening to my own crunch almost in real time. So when he changed the volume and the sensitivity of the microphone, that crunch, when I heard the crunch getting louder, my perception was that that crisp, that Pringles was crisp. Um, and I think Charles went to write a paper about freshness. So the perception was when that Pringle seemed, sounded softer, the perception was it was stale. It was a moment of stale. Again, it comes down to um, it comes down to the memory. And from there, yeah, indeed, we did the um, we did the experiment. We did a bacon and egg ice cream experiment. We just we made two bacon and egg ice creams. One got more bacon flavour, one got more egg flavour. So one of them we played the noise of sizzling uh, bacon. Um, it might be fizzy water actually, wasn't it? Yeah, it sounded like sizzling bacon. And the other one was Ireland was chicken flake, and it had an effect. Anyway, just, at first they think it's bizarre, but why should it be? It's just, it's just <coughs> pushing, it's just nudging the memory down a certain, a certain part. So I don't think there's some really exciting work to be done where um, Barry mentioned where you're talking about this um, sounds. Uh, and actually, two, one of the most embarrassing presentations I've ever done, I've done a few of them, was in San Sebastian's big gastronomic congress, and this was 2004, 2005. So I was trying to do two things, use the concept of a metaphor to generate an emotion. So we all know what we mean when we say, I feel it like a kid in a sweet shop. But your sweet shop's all going to be different to what's in your head, but that's a metaphor for excitement. So we were using an animation to try and generate this excitement to put people in this particular frame of mind before they came to the dark. Then I was talking about the, um, the, 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 the kind of cross-modal element where you can um, because of the synesthesia or there's no association. So you think about it, it becomes a language. So somebody, somebody can be sharp, their personality can be sharp, a knife can be sharp, lemon juice can be sharp. And um, so I, I had this real glass, hand blown, quite expensive, very fine wine glass, and I put a slate of tile on the floor. So the translation wasn't simultaneous, so everything was taking a long time. We went on an hour and a half later, uh, so most people before you can sleep, and I said, right. If I run and drop this glass and think about the noise it makes when it hits the slate, it smashes. I said, it wouldn't be a banana thinking everyone's going to think it could be a, a, a lemon or a passion fruit. Anyway, this hand blown glass dropped from here just went boing. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted the floor to open up and swallow it. Anyway, you look at that now, that stuff seems, it seems much more because of the work that um, the kind of collaboration and sharing the um, research we've done, the work the work Charles has done, the work that as I said um, Barry Barry, guys at the uh, University here, Martin Owens, um, Nottingham, Reading, Bristol, all of that, that collaboration is that's the advancement of advancement of science. The main the amazing thing is we haven't had a historical or well, recent problem in this country where the uptake of science is uh, we are one of the greatest, have one of the greatest traditions of science in any country in the world. And I think cooking and food has the ability, it's, it's the science of everyday life and the world of perception. And I tell you, if we don't, if we did, you don't get excited about that kind of discovery, understanding what happens when you put food in our mouths, and just that can be able to be reduced back to a, kid, a child again, and that excitement, then I don't think, well, what will what we excite you? So I just say that really for, you mentioned before about, about the collaboration, and that is, it's incredibly, incredibly important. And then William Blake said, the true method of knowledge is experiment. And that, to add to that, I, I would put collaboration. Um, and the important thing is, 
then you then feed the information back in the back into the system, and that's how it really works. So anyway, I'm incredibly honoured to uh, see this board. Thank you very much.